Okay, well, today we're going to uh, uh, turn up the dial a little bit and, and talk about another um, concept that called mixed strategies and has the element of surprise and certainly built into um, to game theory. We're going to work with our ideas of probability, probability weighted averages, you know, about payoffs in this game uh, to uh, sort of get a handle on what, um, how to interpret this concept. It's a very interesting idea, both kind of in history of game theory as well as kind of in practical a applications of how to bring in the element of unpredictability into a strategic situation uh, and then how to kind of work with somebody else's bringing into a game unpredictability. But before we do that, what I'd like you to do is to try to think about things you don't know. And this is a fairly simple kind of question in one sense. Have a, have a look at this question. I'm hoping that it will have improved your results from when we did it last time. Okay. So, again, it's not an exam question. I'm not keeping track of these marks. What I, uh, after I get these back, I'm going to go back and co connect them with the uh, quiz we did about I don't know, it was two lectures ago or, or two weeks ago, and just see, you know, did, did I actually get anything across here or not? Uh, we'll have a quick look at how to 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 uh, think about this question because we're going to use these basic ideas tomorrow and the next uh, two lectures when we're thinking about games of asymmetric information. But I realized uh, as I looked over my notes from the previous week that we probably probably making it a little bit too technical in one way because it's more just thinking about this uncertainty stuff. So this is a uh, a little question. Maybe if you're law, you'll find this question interesting because it's really how to assess the evidence from a witness to an automobile accident and to see what you can make out of their, their report about what was going on. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the text that I'm handing out. I can just scratch down your name and your student number. Again, that's just so I can make it a bit easier to record it when I can't read your writing uh, uh, of your name. And have a thought about how you would interpret evidence if, from a, a witness, okay? So it starts out, a cab was involved in a hit-and-run accident at night when the visibility was poor. There's one witness. You're given the following information. Two cab companies, red and blue, operate in the city. There are 100 cabs in the total in the city. 85 of the cabs are red, and 15 of the 100 cabs are blue. The witness reported that the cab involved in the accident was blue. But witnesses aren't always perfect. Okay? So next it says, the court tested the reliability of the witness under the same circumstances that existed on the night of the accident and concluded that the witness's report correctly identified blue cabs on poor visibility nights 80% of the time and also correctly identified green cabs on poor visibility nights 80% of the time. Then... The question is, given this kind of information, okay, what do you think the chances are that the cab involved in the accident is blue after having heard the witness's report? And so I just a few little tick boxes, and if you can come up with a numerical uh, guess, then uh, that would be interesting too. Okay, so it'll take three or four minutes to uh, to do that. Can I grab one of these? You can talk with your neighbor if you like. I'm not worried about uh, super much about the independence of your answering here. It's just, you know, how do you think about this?
Remember, you're not sort of doing this with a family farm or anything like that. It's just, can I get my head around this idea? How do I think about uncertainty when I'm given other bits of information? Uh, and again, it's a learning exercise. You know, uh, it may be you still don't have a clue. You can also, you can give a number or give a guess and also tick, I don't have a clue. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, I died. Well, I had another statement. Um, the the actual question comes from an experiment they did with a bunch of people, and it, it's but it it's still it's more ambiguous because they don't actually um, the way they express it. So I thought I'd change around, but yeah, agree. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, well, everybody else does too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So they're really good at identifying green ones and, and blue ones, but no one knows. But <laughs> okay, um, Jason just pointed out to me that um, the last line says uh, they also correctly identified green cabs on poor visibility nights, and there aren't any green cabs in the city. So it's kind of a problem, right? We we um, if you if you have a little funny hint, I mean, I'm hoping you interpreted it as red, but if you didn't, don't worry about it. The um, there are blue cabs and there are red cabs, and and the the way it's written up is that the court, which does crazy things sometimes, anyhow, they, they, these guys are pretty good at green cabs and they're pretty good at blue cabs. So nobody really knows what they're very good at red cabs. You know, you want to just, uh, just kind of stop what you're doing now, just kind of pass them in, out to the aisles and or down down towards the front. Again, it's it's just for me to kind of see, you know, especially for those who did the question before, it'll be helpful to think, ah, oh, they're getting a bit of a clue here, you know, uh, or maybe not. Now, I've also put a um, uh, a question up. Um, on that was on one of the previous exams. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. Um, about um, just this kind of thing. This very famous case where Ronald Reagan was um, uh, shot, and uh, the the guy who um, uh, shot him was actually got off because he um, he claimed that uh, he was uh, mentally ill, and the, and the, his lawyers were like O.J. Simpson's lawyers. They're really good. They presented evidence which the court bought, and. There's a little question about that to have a look at it, okay? So it's up. I just put it up on the web this morning. And there's a, um, again, it's a matter of kind of reading through, getting a little bit of the history, but it, it's this thing as well. I don't really know, you know, the people who saw the thing, they don't really know uh, the, what the information is, but I, they, they make some kind of report, and I have to figure out what the underlying sort of state of things are given somebody else's diagnostic report about things which we know could be good, could be bad, okay? So, uh, one way you can think about this is um, uh, by looking at, uh, I'm just going to do this really fast, okay, because I put this up in the web. And uh, what it is, you can, you can um, break it down into, um, I want to know whether the cab is, uh, is blue or not. Uh, the witness report is it's blue or not. Those could be all true or false. Put on a little truth table. You know, think of putting our natural frequencies along here like the Gigerenzer thing with, you know, 15 of the cabs are blue, 85 are red. When these guys see a blue cab, 80% of the time they recognize the blue cab, so that's 12 out of 3. When they see a red cab, 80% of the time they report it as red, so that's 68 out of the 17. And then you can, oh, okay, I'm getting a kind of an idea here. There's 15 red cabs, 85 blue cabs. These are the times the witnesses reports are, are true that they're red when they are red. This is they're true when they are they're blue when they are blue. And these are the ones where they make some mistakes. And then you go through and you calculate these inverse probabilities. And it comes out to about 40%, okay? And uh, there's another way, I think a little bit easier way of doing this. And I'm getting a, 
I, I don't like these numbers, you know. It's always, you got to divide and subtract and things like that. It gets to be a pain in the butt because you always make wrong calculations, you know. I'm terrible at keeping track of decimal points. I don't know. I got through high school, okay. and uh, But uh, I still haven't really mastered the art, you know, multiplying and dividing fractions by one another and keeping track of the decimal points. So another way you could think about it is to use this little graphical approach. You could say, well, okay, the cab is blue. Okay, uh, the witness report is blue. Probabilities of these things, uncertainties, go from zero to one, zero to one. Uh, so we make a little box, okay? And you could do it, you know, you could have them flipped around another way, but this is just one way of looking at it. And what you can think of is that if the, if the cab really is blue, these guys report blue 80% of the time. So I'm putting that over in the right-hand side because over here, these numbers down here run from zero to one, and they're the chances the cab is blue. So if I know, if, if they, you know, if the cab really is blue, then the probability assessment is 80% of the time they're going to report blue. So I go up here, 80%. On the other hand, <clears throat> green, okay. I did this this morning, all right. We got a red cab. Uh, if it's a red cab, it's not a blue cab, so it's a 0% chance it's a blue cab. So, but given it's a red cab, then um, they're going to report it as a red cab 80% of the time, so 20% of the time they're going to say it's blue, so I put that little 20% down there. And then I draw some numbers in, which we did last time. I put some little bullet points of these numbers are. I draw a little line like this and put these little dotted lines in. I think, oh, okay, that's just, what's that doing? Well, that's telling me, it's beginning to tell me how I should think about the inverse probability, which I'm really interested in, in which is, given the guy has given me a report it's blue, what are the chances that the cab is really blue? Okay? So, to get that, we had to know what are the chances that the cab is blue or red? Okay? Um, well, 85 cabs are red, 15 out of the 100 are blue, so 15% are blue, so we put a probability the cab is blue at 15% here, a little bullet point. Draw that little dotted line up there, look at the intersection between those two lines, draw that little dot, and think, ah, okay. What's that little dot? Well, that dot, all those little dots are just ways of representing your uncertainty. Okay, one is that, how reliable is this witness? Not bad, 80% of the time they get it right. And 80 that means that when the cab is red, They'll say it's red 80% of the time, and the cab is blue, they'll say it 80% of the time, but sometimes they'll get it wrong, okay? So that's the two extreme dots, up over here to the right and the other right. And again, you know, they could be up, but they could be down a little bit, but 20 and 80. So it's not a bad witness report, but not perfect, okay? The diagnostic report, the signal, isn't a perfectly correct, accurate indicator of the, the uh, state of the cab, okay? And so you want to take account of that. And so you think, well, how am I going to interpret this report? Well, there's 15% chance of, you know, just kind of, if you're closing your eyes and you open them, you know, and you saw a cab on a poor night, there's a 15% chance it'll be red and uh, uh, blue and 85% chance it'll be red. So I put this little number there. So this little dot and that little dot and that little dot are your ideas of uncertainty about things which sort of make sense. But we're also interested in something different, which is not given the cab is red, what are the chances he's going, to, he's going to say it's red, or given it's blue, what are the chances he's going to say it's blue? Because those are 80%. That's pretty high. It's a pretty good witness, okay? Not perfect, but pretty good. What we want is the other report, which is, or the other probability, which is, you know, given the report, what do I, now what do I think the chances are of, of the cab being blue? Well, before I heard the report, I would have thought like 15, you know? That's what we call this base rate or this... And so the, the, the technique that I said was put in a little guideline that goes from the origin through that dot like this right up here. And where it intersects that little dotted line up here, the 80% one, put another line like up here, pop that up there, and that's going to be your probability that the cab is blue given the report is blue. Now, if I have a piece of graph paper, I can count over 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, it's somewhere between 40 and 50%. You know, I, I mean, depending where you draw your lines, that's going to be what it is. And so the idea is that you, you're recognizing this is an imperfect signal. And the imperfection comes because one out of five times he gets it wrong. Okay? Now, if you hadn't heard the report, you would have thought, ah, pretty small chance that the cab is blue. But given you've heard the report, you want to say, you know, if, if the guy was perfectly, if you, if you knew he saw it and you knew he was an accurate, 100% accurate witness, you'd say, well, your porter is blue. It must be blue. But you just heard the report blue. You know he isn't perfectly accurate. 
but you, you so you push your probability up from 15% up to somewhere it's about 41 I think if you do the calculations okay and why is it 41 well what you th- what are you thinking of you know why isn't it 80 well what you're thinking of is there's a lot of red cabs out there okay like 85 out of 100 20 percent of the time these re- uh, these red cabs are going to be recognized as blue cabs by witnesses who are imperfect on nights of poor visibility okay so 20 percent of 85 is like 17 you know roughly. So you're going to get 17 witness reports out of 85 red cabs that are blue, that are false, you know, and what do you got? 15 red cabs, 15 blue cabs, you're only going to get 80% of those being right, so what's that about uh, uh, 12? <laughs> so you're actually going to get more reports that are, that are false than are true. And that's where you get this, just a just little bit under 50%. Okay, so that's kind of the, the idea. But, I mean, the, doing the calculations is always tough, tough. That's why I think the graphs, after you get used to them, are actually better than the numbers, because it just gives you a ballpark idea, you know? Okay. And so the, the, concept, the concept here is that we, we were uncertain about what the signal said about the underlying state, what the witness, the diagnostic report, the witness report was about whether or not the cab was the blue one, Okay. If we, we could just take our base rate, well, the chances are, you know, it's 15 out of, eight, out of 85 or, or 15 out of 100 are blue. But we've got more information now. We've learned something because we've got this diagnostic report. Okay. So um, go, up, go and have a look at the, um, there's a video clip I've, I made of this uh, from, from last year, uh, which kind of walks it through if you still don't get your head around it. But even before you look at that, go and have a look at the Hinckley, uh, a question on, on Hinckley and his uh, shooting of, of um, uh, Reagan, and kind of just see if you can work your way through and, you know, try and get an idea of this inverse probability. Now, we'll come, this tomorrow, I think it'll be tomorrow, when we look at signaling and screening, I'll actually draw a little diagram after you work through a nice little, some nice little uh, numerical examples to figure out, when you're moving along the game tree, you know, you're kind of out here and you're looking back, you're seeing things, and as you're moving along, you know, you're trying to look back and say, what have I learned from things in the past that I didn't know much about before, you know, and what, these are signals of various things, and it'll depend upon stuff, which will be strategies. Okay, and we'll come up with Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium helps you work out what the strategy. Uh, it helps you. Nash equilibrium helps you think about various kinds of sensible probabilities and beliefs you can have as you're moving out in the game tree when you're not sure of things. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in the next couple lectures. But before we get there, we have to finish off one thing about simultaneous games. We, we way back we started out with a game. Uh, two by two game, you know, always PDIP. Go to the players. What can they do? What's their information? What are their payoffs? And what, well, there was one of these games that didn't have a Nash equilibrium. And this was a uh, uh, line out throw kind of game, or in the text, it's a tennis game, um, uh, whether to, you know, play down, uh, down the line or cross court kind of things, or whether to defend down the line or cross court. The idea here is that uh, if we're looking at a line out game, uh, New Zealand can throw short, they can throw long, Australia can uh, defend short, defend long, and these payoffs represent the success probabilities. Okay, So at one level, there's kind of some information about the payoffs each of the players are their chances of winning the line out. Okay? And so if, we, if, they both def- if they're both, New Zealand is throwing short and Australia is defending short, it's 50-50. Okay? But if um, New Zealand is throwing long, and Australia is defending long, and it's 2080. It's like really bad for New Zealand over here. The red are for New Zealand, the blue are probability of success probability for Australia. On the other hand, if New Zealand throws long and Australia defends short, then there's a 90% chance that New Zealand is going to succeed, okay? And over here, a short throw against a long defense, again, 80% chance. I mean, in a way, these numbers are just made up, but believe me, uh, I think that any professional rugby team uh, would be going, or any professional sport, would be going through and looking at these things, you know. How successful are we in all these different kinds of occasions? Collecting these natural frequencies so we can try and figure out what's going to happen next time we play this game. Okay, so, so we think of this kind of, these are the payoffs. Now, what's the strategies? Well, Australia defends short and New Zealand throws short, they're going to get a 50% chance. But if I throw long, they can go 90% chance. So why not throw long? Well, if they throw long, then what should Australia do? Well, they get a, if they're defending short, they've got a 10% chance of winning. But if they go to defending long, they've got an 80% chance of winning. But, of course, if they defend long, then New Zealand shouldn't throw short because they could improve their chances. But if they throw short, then 
Oh, so he's not going to thin long. They're, you know, it just goes round and round and round and round. That's the circular reasoning thing, where there isn't any Nash equilibrium. Okay, and that's it's, that in itself is just a good thing to recognize. There isn't, you know, when you look at the payoffs in the game and what the players are doing uh, uh, or can possibly do, it, it doesn't seem to settle down to anything reasonable like the Nash equilibrium, like giving you do this and. And that's my best response, and given my best response, that's what you do. Uh, you've got a best response, and gee, those two things fit together. That's a sensible prediction, okay? Or the dominant strategy reasoning that we used. So what we do is what we're going to do is uh, introduce an element of surprise, okay? And the surprise comes from these concepts called a P-mix or a Q-mix. You know, the, the P's and the Q's are just to, we're going to work, use those terms for probabilities, okay? But the key thing is that, that these strategies throw in short, and throwing long, are, or defending short and defending long, are pure strategies. That is, you know, the the uh, the hooker is going to give a code, the other guys are going to read it, and the code is going to be okay. I'm throwing long, okay, but the, and but you're trying to mask it so the other people can't read it, you know. And meanwhile, the Australian guys are, you know, they're jiggling around and uh, they, they've got to make up a strategy what they're going to do. They've got some coding, okay. No, we're going to, you know, we're going to defend it long, or we're going to defend short. There's, but neither party knows what the other party's little strategies are to choose these codes and get these across. The, there is going to be a pure strategy choice, but if you step back and you think, well, what are the chances that New Zealand's going to throw short? So that's what the P is. The P is the chances that New Zealand is going to throw short. Okay? Because New Zealand, New Zealand is not going to throw short every time. Right? Because if they did, Australia would defend every time, in which case... Australia wouldn't, New Zealand wouldn't be making the best response by throwing short every time. They'd be rather to, to go long, in which case we go around the circle again. Okay, so what we're trying to think of is supposing we expand the strategy possibilities and we don't just say, you've got to throw short, you've got to throw long. What you can do is you can create an element of surprise here. Okay, might be short, might be long, you have to guess. Okay, and the other guys might, you know, the um, New Zealand guys, well, they could defend long, defend, long. I have to guess. Okay, so the guessing is the P mix. So P is the probability of short for New Zealand, and Q is the probability of short for Australia. Okay? So the game expands. We'll keep the same kind of payoffs, but now we want to think, um, uh, but these are the success strategies, but what are, what are the, how are we going to think about this game now that we've got these expanded array of strategies? Well, it turns out there is an Ash equilibria in mixed strategies, even though there isn't one in pure strategies. So let's have a look. Um, first, just before we do that, I want to remind you about probability weighted averages. I'm trying to avoid you having to do calculations. If you look in Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, there's lots of stuff you want to ignore, okay? Lots of algebra. Uh, and uh, whether it's algebra or numerical calculations, you know, it, it's very easy to get kind of confused about what's going on because you can't follow the algebra, because you can't follow the equations, and sometimes even because you can't follow the graph. Well, I'm going to try and... Uh, and, and I think the graphs are actually confusing in the text a little bit. But I'm going to try and build up a little graphical thing where we don't have to rely so much on um, on um, uh, numeric or algebraic calculations. But one thing we have to do is sort of think about probability weighted averages because those are the payoffs, the, those are the way of thinking about payoffs that we're going to have to worry about. If you're in New Zealand okay, and you're going to throw short and you know Australia is is got a chance of going short and a chance of going long, you're not sure what your payoff is. It's going to be either 50 or 80. Okay? If you go long, it's either going to be 90 or 20. It's one of these contingent payoffs. You're not sure because it depends what the other guy does. But if you can come up with a, a belief about what a, the other person is going to do, like, you know, should I believe Australia is going to defend short 90% of the time or 10%? Well, we're going to try and work that out. But if, I, if you could come up with a belief, then what I would do is I'd say, I want to take a probability weighted average of numbers like, like uh, you know, um, uh, for New Zealand, 50 and 80. Uh, for Australia, 80 and 20. Uh, all kinds of different numbers. Okay, so let's take, um, sorry, this one here. I should have made, I wanted to, to make these blue. So let me change the color there. Just Okay, so let's, let's have a look. If Australia is going to defend long, they're either going to get a, they're going to get a payoff of 20 or a payoff of 80, which is the success chances are going to be 20% if New Zealand throws short, and they're going to be 80% if New Zealand throws long. Okay? So they're either going to get a 20 or an 80, and if it was 50-50, so if New Zealand was 
going 50-50 on shorter long, then Australia would get halfway in between, which would be about 50, right? So let's put that in there. So if we put a line between 80 and 20, go halfway in between, why halfway? Because we're just thinking of a P-mix for New Zealand of 50-50, then Australia is going to get a probability weighted average of 50. Come on, John, get your colors right. Because we're thinking of Australia here. Okay, payoffs. On the other hand, I'm going to get the wrong color again. Supposing that it's, there's a 35, a 75% chance that New Zealand's going to go long. Or a 25% chance that New Zealand's going to go short. Okay? So then they're going to get a 75% chance of weight on 80 and a 20% chance weight on 20. You can do the numbers and it comes out to 70, which we should put in blue. But the key thing is that most of the weight now is going to be on the 80% chance rather than the 70% chance. So we're going to move up and down a line like this to, to reflect these possible weighted averages payoffs that Australia is going to get from playing long, depending upon what New Zealand's P-mix is. I had to say that quickly. It's a little bit easier. We'll probably say it about 10 times during the class. Let's have a, a little look at it, this graph where it's a bit easier to see. Okay. So first thing, let's have a look at um, how we think about the payoffs in this game. And this is it, always with games of imperfect information, not always, but most always, the most difficult thing is to figure out how am I going to understand what people's payoffs here? Well, we've got one thing is we want to take probability weighted averages of, of, of numbers and let's see how we can think of, uh, uh, when we don't know what the probabilities are, let's see what, how we can think of uh, these, what these payoffs are. We come up with a little graph, okay? And the graph works something like this. Um, let's imagine that 80-20 line that we had here, okay? So Australia, we're thinking of Australia, and we're going to look at Australia's payoffs against a, uh, a strategy of New Zealand, which could is a P-mix, which is like 10% on short, 20% on short, 30% on short, you know, up to 90% on short, with the other percentage going going along. Okay, so we put this down here, New Zealand's P-mix along this axis. Now, what's this? 80, uh, we're going to concentrate on this blue line going from here down to here. Okay. Uh, these 80-20 numbers are just the 80 and the 20 that come from Australia choosing to play a definite strategy of defending long. They're either going to get a payoff of 80 or a payoff of 20. But what's their probability weighted average payoff? Well, supposing there's a 0% chance that New Zealand's going short. That's a 100% chance that New Zealand's going long. And that means 100% chance on getting 80 rather than 20. So we put a little dot there. Okay. Oops. What about a 10% average? Well, supposing New Zealand plays 10% on short, then 10% then 10 of the weight is going to be on 20, 90% on 80. So between these two lines, again, it's somewhere close to the top, but not quite, about 90% of the way up. Okay. And if we had a 50-50 Example, we'd be 50% of the way between 80 and 20. And if we had 80% on going short, we'd be 80% on the 20 and 20% on the 80. So we'd be down here like this. And that's what that blue line represents. Okay, It's just all of the possible probability weighted averages. So let's get rid of these particular numbers. And what we're thinking of, this blue line says, for any possible PMIX I can think of, from Australia's standpoint, I'm going to think of what my, what my probability rated averages or expected payoffs are. Now, let's put this a little label in here like this. Okay. Now, I've just put in symbols, and we're going to read this from left to right. This is the expected utility or expected payoff to Australia, the blue player, so that's what Australia is, against a PMIC strategy of New Zealand when Australia is definitely choosing to play long. Okay? So this is like, okay, if the P-mix is over here, then my payoffs are going to be high. That is, if the, you know, the way to think of it is Australia is, on the left-hand side, when Australia is choosing long, New Zealand is choosing short with low probability. It's more likely they're going to go long, so they got a pretty high expected payoff. But as the chances are that New Zealand, the chances of New Zealand playing short, it gets high, bigger and bigger and bigger, the payoffs from playing long, expected payoffs get smaller and smaller and smaller. And they happen to lie along the straight line there. Okay? So that's the key thing. And where do you find the straight line? Well, you put your 80-20 mark, your 80 and 20, and just draw your straight line between that bullet point and that corner and that bullet point and that corner. 
Let's have a look at the other line. What's this line over here? Let's get rid of the 80-20 lines. Put in some gray lines at 50 and 10. Why 50 and 10? Well, because if Australia chooses to defend short, then they're either going to get 50 or 10. 50 or 10. 50 or 10. 50 or 10. Chances are, if, if, if probabilities are high, New Zealand's going to play low, uh, sorry, play short, then uh, they, they're going to get close. To, they're going to get 50. Okay, might get 10, but probability weighted averages will be close to 50. So that's why this line over here, when P is close to one, red P is close to one, New Zealand's P mix is close to one. Australia's expected payoffs are going to be close to 50. But as a, New Zealand's P mix goes down here to zero, or gets closer to zero, 10 percent, 20 percent. Okay, the chances are that New Zealand's going to be playing long. They're going to be defending short. And so they're more, much more likely to get 10% rather than 50%. The weighted average drops down there. So this line over here is the expected payoff or expected utility to Australia. That's why it's in blue. From a, against a P-mix of, of New Zealand when Australia plays short. Okay. Now, this graph is a way of thinking systematically about all of the payoffs Australia is, could get. Okay? They can either play short, they can either play long. Okay? The, each of those lines tells us what the expected payoff will be, given that uh, they don't really know what New Zealand's going to do, but it covers all the possibilities. Okay? Now, given that it covers all the possibilities, what we can do is look at the best responses. See where the two lines cross. Okay? Where those two lines cross, now this is going to be a, kind of an important element of New Zealand's strategic reasoning. Remember, we're just, this is Australia thinking about what their payoffs are. But that crossing point, at that crossing point, now again, if you look down here, you draw the line where the crossing point is, it looks like about 0.7. Well, it works out to be exactly 0.7. So that particular prob red probability of 0.7, that particular P mix of 0.7, where 70% chance on, on going short for New Zealand, 30% chance of going, uh, going long, has the property that Australia has the same expected payoff. If they play short, if they play long, you know, they don't, they're going to get the same expected payoff because the height of those two graphs is the same right at that point. Okay? It looks like about 40 is what their expected payoff is going to be, but don't forget about the absolute number here. Just think if the payoff is the same. Now, the thing is, when you're, when you're in your situation and of uncertainty and you're trying to decide between something and the payoff is one thing and the payoff is another thing and both of those expected payoffs are the same, how do you choose? It's hard to choose, right? So you're kind of indifferent. And that's going to be New Zealand's strategy. It's like, ooh, if I play 70% of the time short, just where that line, vertical line is, then I can make Australia not have any clear choice, okay? Because if I play less than that, the red player, if New Zealand plays less than that, then it's clear that the expected playoff in paying along is greater than the expected payoff in playing short because this blue line up here is above that blue line down there, right? So for P mixes to the left of that vertical line, 0.7, it's much better for Australia to play um, long, okay? For P mixes to the right, it's much better for Australia to play short. But just at that particular point, 70% P-mix chance is a probability for New Zealand where Australia isn't sure really what the best thing to do is, okay? So that, and that's kind of the idea, that's certainly one key idea about the element of surprise, okay? You want to keep the other player guessing. They don't know what you're going to do. You know that they don't know what you're going to do. And you want to make it difficult for them to come up with a clean response. You know, should I go left, should I go right, you know, or long, short? You're the police, okay? You've got to set up some roadblocks for, for catching people on uh, uh, nights when they might be drinking. You know, if you go to the same place all the time, you know, on Blenheim Road, <laughs> you know, are people going to go down Blenheim Road after the drinking? Of course not. They're going to go around, okay? So you've got you to mix the strategy. And uh, same way if you're at the Inland Revenue, you know, and you know some people, eh, not a lot maybe, but some people are going to be cheating on their, their, uh, um, uh, their uh, tax returns or their GST returns. You know, you're going to, You'd like to audit a lot, but it's really expensive to audit a lot, you know. But if you're always if you're always auditing the A's, 
You know, then the A's are going to change their name. <laughs> they're not going to be, well, they're going to change their name or they're not going to be cheating, but all the BCs and Ds will because they can tell. You know, so you've got to randomize a bit. You've got to make it surprise. And the, the thing, the element of surprise is make sure the opponent doesn't have a clear choice what to do. Make it difficult for them to make a clear choice. Okay? So, uh, it's an idea. This particular, um, this particular number, 0.7 is for the red is a um, a strategy that keeps the other player indifferent. Okay. Now Australia again is still in position; they don't know what New Zealand's going to do. Okay, but they've worked out what their best responses are. So let's let's take a little let's make a little graph up here. Where I'm going to put New Zealand's P mix on the horizontal axis goes from zero to one. Australia's Q mix on the vertical axis goes from zero to one. And what I want to think about is, okay. If I'm Australia, I've got to choose between going long or uh, defending long or defending short. Now, if I defend long as Australia, that's like a Q of 100% for me, right? Because, I'm uh, sorry, a, a Q of 0% because this, the Q mix, the probability of, of Australia choosing short, if that's zero, then 100% chance is going to choose long. And over here, this is 100% chance of choosing long. Okay, and over here, this is 100% chance of choosing short. Now let's graph that kind of same information up here. Uh, where the p mix for New Zealand is less than 0.7, where the p mix for New Zealand is less than 0.7, Australia should go long. That is, 100% of the time they should go long. Okay, there's no in between here. It's just long or short, and long gives a, a higher expected payoff. Uh, I mean, you can also show that there is no in-between. It's always better to go 100% long in those cases. So along this axis, where the probability mix for New Zealand is small, we're putting in this sort of shaded line the best response curve for Australia. 0% chance of going short, always go long. Then when it hits this critical point, it jumps up. And for probabilities above that critical point over here, it's best to go short. So you put 100% chance on Australia going short along there. So this curve going along here and then jumping up to here, and we're going to fill in the jump, okay, is what Aust Australia's best response would be to any PMIX strategy of New Zealand. Now, what's going on along this line up here? Well, along this line, it doesn't matter what you do as Australia. You're probably, if you're playing short, you're going to get this expected payoff. If you're playing long, you're going to get that expected payoff. If you play some mixture between the two, it's just a probability weighted average of those two things that are the same, you're going to get the same expected payoff. So we put a vertical line along here like that. Okay. So if you like, this is the best response for Australia, given any strategy choice, which is the P-mix for New Zealand, goes along a curve like that. Okay. Now, what we've done is we've worked out just kind of like what we did uh, with the payoff matrices, except for this is a continuous strategy one. And the strategies now are P-mixes and Q-mixes. And we had this little curve that says, OK, uh, here's the best responses of Australia to what, New to what New Zealand is doing. They go along here like this. What about New Zealand's responses to what Australia is doing? And that's what we're going to look at the next one. Okay. Oops, let me get rid of this. Okay, so here's the same graph, but it's different. It's different colors, is one thing. And what we've done is we've put a probability weighted average Q mix for Australia. This is Australia's element of surprise. What are they going to do? How often are they going to defend long? Or what the chances are of them defending long? What are the chances of them defending short? Okay, and over here, the chances of them defending short are really high. And over there, they're really low. Well, what, what's, what's in it for New Zealand, depending on what Australia does? Well, <clears throat> let me just make sure that I've... Supposing New Zealand decides to throw short, okay, then they're either going to get 50 or 20, depending on what Australia does. It, right? So we put in lines at 50 and, oh, sorry, 50 and 80. They're either going <clears> to <throat> excuse me, get a 50% chance of success or an 80% chance. Depends. Okay? So we take the probability weighted averages. What probabilities do we use? Well, depends what Australia is going to do. What's Australia going to do? Well, they're going to choose their Q mix, their probability. Okay? So if that probability is small, sitting over here like this, let's put in these lines of 50 over 80, 50 and 80, 
if Australia is going to choose a, going short, so if Australia is going to choose a cumix uh, of going short of 100%, then chances are New Zealand is going to get 50. They're going to be down here. On the other hand, if Australia chooses a cumix of zero, that is 100% chance they're going to go long, then New Zealand's going to get 80. So we put that line over there. Draw the straight line in between them. And that's just all the probability weighted averages for New Zealand. What their expected payoff is against Australia. That's right. I'm going to get the colors right here. This line is the expected payoffs or expected utility for New Zealand. They're the red guys, okay? So for New Zealand, against a Qmix in Australia, which is running out along this axis here, and if that's, if that's the case when they're playing short. Okay. So and the idea is, as long as Australia is playing long, playing short is a good, is, uh, is a good idea, you're going to get a success rate of 80%. But as, as, as Australia more and more has a tendency to defend towards uh, playing short, your expected payoffs are going down. On the other hand, let's look at it for... New Zealand against Australia playing long. Okay. Your payoffs are going to be between 90 and 20. Right? You're uncertain. You're New Zealand. It could be 90. It could be 20. It could be 90. It could be 20. It could be 90. It could be 20. You know, you kind of go into a catatonic state. as okay. What am I going to do? You know, and, well, they've got a code work out. You know, you work it out. Take your, uh, do your thing. But you still don't know what your payoffs are going to be. Um, you're either going to throw long or you're going to throw short. And it depends what Australia does, what your payoffs are going to be. And if Australia is defending short and you throw long, so Qmix of, of 100%, you're going to get the 90 up there. This 90 here this corresponds to that 90 there. Otherwise, you're just going to get 20, which is down like that. And again, the line is upward sloping to reflect the fact that for New Zealand, their expected payoffs are going up when they throw long when the chances are that Australia is going to defend short. Again, the two curves cross. There's one point in the middle there. Okay, this is, this is going to be the special Q-mix where New Zealand is indifferent. They don't know what to do. Okay? If, if Australia's chances are less than 0.6, New Zealand should be throwing short. If, if Australia puts on a Q-mix of more than 0.6, New Zealand ought to be going long. So let's put in our best responses of New Zealand there just to kind of highlight them out like this. So that intersection point tells us, okay, you know, Australia puts their cumix too low, then New Zealand's going to respond with throwing short. If, if Australia puts it too high, New Zealand's going to respond long. And there's one critical value where New Zealand is just indifferent. Okay, and here's the best responses. Now, let's chunk, let's throw those back in the graph that we had before. Remember, what we want to do is we want to plot New Zealand's best responses against Australia's Q-mixes here. Okay? Well, a New Zealand best response of short is a 100% chance on short. A New Zealand best response of long is a 0% chance on short. Right. So, let me plunk all these, these shaded regions in. Let's have, how do we read this little, this little graph? And I'm going to put the, the horizontal line here like this. It says, I'm trying to figure out what New Zealand's best responses are. New Zealand's best responses are either to go short or to go long, okay? But going short is 100% chance of going short. Going long is a 0% chance, okay? Um, so when Australia's got a high probability of, going sh of defending short, then New Zealand wants to go long or put a, a, a low probability of going short. So, did I say that right? Yes. Whew. Okay, so... We're looking at the blue axis and trying to figure out what uh, the blue axis is what Australia is going to do. Over here to the right, above 0.6, up over here, we're shading in this region for New Zealand because their best response is to put a 0% chance on defending short when, it's <clears throat> when Australia is going to uh, put a high chance. Did I say that right? Let's say it again. Start from the beginning. Okay. Over here to the right, Australia. It's got this Q-mix. They're trying to figure out, am I going to defend short or defend long? Let's defend short, says Australia, with a high probability. And New Zealand uh, is better to throw long. If they're going to throw long, that means they're not throwing short. So it's a 0% chance of them throwing short. And there's their best response. <clears throat> On the other range of probabilities over here to the right, it's better for New Zealand to, to play short or 100% chance. So we put a 
red line over here, 100%, 100%, 100%. That's their best response. What about at this critical value, the, the point 0.6? Well, it doesn't matter for New Zealand. Okay? They defend short, they defend long, they're getting the same expected payoff. <coughs> if they defend anywhere in between, it, they're getting the same expected payoff. They're totally indifferent all the way along here. Okay? Let's put in the Australian investor response. And I know it looks kind of swastikish. There's nothing intentional about that. It just happens to be the best response curves. That intersection point is the Nash equilibrium. Okay. Now, look at how long it took us, like 50 minutes to, to crunch through this, okay? So I'm not going to ask you, take this table, construct this graph on an exam, because it would take you that long, and you get make little mistakes like I do, okay? But what we only want to be able to do is take, if you had some graphs, could you work out what the best responses are? Can you work out what the Nash equilibrium is? And here, the idea is the Nash equilibrium is that each player will be trying to create an element of surprise. They don't know what the other player is going to do. They're uncertain about what the other player is going to do. But they can actually work out an exact number for their, to describe their uncertainty. They can be pretty sure about the... Uh, New Zealand can be pretty sure about what the mixed strategy for Australia can be, and Australia can be pretty sure about what the mixed strategy for New Zealand can be. Okay. So this is, this is how we resolve these games without Nash equilibria. And this is one of the reasons that uh, um, uh, John Nash got his Nobel Prize and, was, and is always very famous and why it's called a Nash equilibrium. Because Nash proved, this sort of mathematically, that basically any game has a Nash equilibrium. But it could be a Nash equilibrium in these mixed strategies, okay, where players are randomizing a little bit. Okay, so tomorrow we'll come and uh, finish off this idea of mixed strategies. We'll see in Chapter 8 that Battle of the Sexes, Battle of the Two Cultures, all of the other games we've been looking at, the nice coordination games, have mixed strategy solutions. We'll just look at one of those, then we'll move on to signaling and screening. And whatever you do, when you're reading Chapter 7 and 8, don't get hung up in the algebra and equations. I am not going to ask that in, in class, for exam. Just kind of read through it, make the best sense you can.